Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 158. Science Faction denying the correlative. These are the people who deny that the coral reef is dying, the Great Barrier Reef. No, no, it's not that correlative. It's actually, if you were to, to stretch it out, the name of the logical fallacy should in total be denying the correlative conjunction. In that case, what you're saying is denying the word or. So why so, didn't you say the whole thing? Because the actual fallacy, the title of the fallacy, the formal title is denying the correlative. If you were to expand it out, it's kind of like a contraction. You know, all of us that are down with logical fallacies, we know the code. But we see, know what's it up. got him confused. Everything gets him confused. Have you said it? Where am I? He His name exactly. gets him confused. <laughs> is uh, it Jewish or not? So what that means is you're denying the word or. So you're given an either or situation where you only have two options and your response to it doesn't fit in either of those two segments. You try and make a third option or essentially a maybe option. If you are doing that where there really are only two options given to you, you are making a logical fallacy. It has you're to not... be a true dichotomy. Exactly, exactly. Because you, if you're only presented with those two choices and you try and pick a third, then you have not addressed the argument, and therefore it's a fallacious argument that you're making. My favorite example of this is when you hear people ask, you know, are you an atheist or a theist? And you'll hear some people say, oh, I'm an agnostic. That is denying the correlative. Because... In fact, every human being is either a theist or an atheist. You either have a belief in a God concept or you do not. That is a hard line. Theism or atheism talks about what you believe. I believe there's a God or I don't. Agnosticism or Gnosticism talks about your level of certainty, surety, or knowledge of that belief. So I am agnostic in my atheism because I don't think there's a God, but I'm not sure of that. But then somebody how were... sure do you have to be before it qualifies as belief? So this is actually a, a big part of philosophy is where you you break what's called the Gnostic boundary, where you get to that point. And in, in the end, you just have to say that's up to yeah. the individual. Because there's unless you're saying we all follow these exact same rules of knowledge, then you have to say that's what the individual So has. that means that there is a point where you could say, well, I don't know if I believe yet because my but you Gnosticism either, isn't at a high enough Even if threshold. you don't know, you still either believe or not at any given point. And you can switch. You could be a theist one time, atheist one time. You could switch back and forth ten times a day. It doesn't matter. At any given point, every individual is either a theist or an atheist. You have to ask why he doesn't know. If he doesn't know because... He doesn't think God can read brains. And so as long as he doesn't come out and say, I don't believe, he still could have an excuse. Yeah, that, I know a lot of people who play the fence, who... Uh, who Oh, like just in case when they yeah. die, there's a god. Like I know there deal. probably isn't a god, but and I would say to that guy, Cover you bases. Yeah, you're a theist at that point because you were making decisions based upon a mythical being. And your Pascalian wager host yeah, is yeah, none totally. other than myself, Pascal. comedian and archaeologist Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damian Ricardo. Damian, how you doing this evening? Doing fine. Googling Pascal's wager as we speak. <laughs> and our scientist for the evening who doesn't have to Google anything, Mr. Seb Tawa. Seb, how about you? I Google stuff sometimes. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> big butts. I mean, I got my current big butt website. I've gone through it. I need a different big butt website. <laughs> and if you want to look at your big butt websites, come on out here to the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. When you're not doing that, go ahead and check out our website at www.thesciencefaction.com for all the articles we cover, as well as some we don't get to. But for now, we've got some very interesting ones ahead of us. Let's jump right into science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Guys, this first article is rocking the archaeological world. I know all you guys are big into that. This is what we've been waiting for in terms of what we've called one of the last holy grails of archaeology, meaning one of the last big things everybody wants to discover, everybody wants to find, trying desperately, at least for the last hundred years, this is one of the last ones that is basically still a mystery until, arguably, last week. How's archaeology going with discovering the actual Holy Grail? Um, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. See, that's the article we want to read. I thought it was in Petra. We were doing a lot of research based on uh, some old documents about a last crusade. But yeah, eventually we're going to find it. You can tell it because if you can drink water out of it without dying. <laughs> but this last holy grail of archaeology was the occupation of the Americas or how human beings came to occupy North and South America. It's been a huge part of archaeology and even human paleontology for a long time. 
we have had different ideas over time. For a long time, there was this Clovis idea that, you know, 10,000 or so years ago was when that happened. Now, you'll see a lot of articles when they address both this recent article and other stuff saying, oh, they, they destroyed this Clovis idea or Clovis first idea that the Clovis were the first people. That idea was destroyed 20 some odd years ago. That's been bunk. So automatically take that off the table. But what we don't know is when people came down into the Americas and how they occupied it. We know there was a group that became genetically isolated in what we now call Beringia, which we might as well call Atlantis because it's now underwater. It's in between uh, Russia and the Bering Strait. They became genetically isolated in that place. They lived there for a few thousand years and then basically spread into the Americas. Every Native American group, except the Dorset people in Canada, which came later, so basically everybody from parts of Canada all the way down to the tip of South America came from one wave of migration of those Beringia people at some point in the last 25,000 years. Or as the natives call them, maize. No, David! <laughs> what about uh, the theory that there were Polynesians who sailed over to Chile? Uh, well, the problem with that is that these groups vastly outdate the time of the Polynesian origin. So Polynesians okay. uh, or originated in the Taiwan area about three to 4,000 years ago. They proceed through the Lapita culture, which is a type of ceramic culture. These people have been, had been occupying there for tens of thousands of years at this point. So, But uh, did the Polynesians actually sail over to yes, Chile? Okay, they did. But there were people there already. Yes, indeed. And that's also a very interesting story, too. One that we're not going to get into. No. The one that you're just going to tease the fans we've, with. We actually discussed it before about finding uh, uh, DNA from Native South Americans on Easter Island. So they actually landed here, stole some women, and went back. Very, very interesting stuff. Oh, but maybe the women took them. Like, Ooh, oh, look at that big man in a big boat. <laughs> I love your face tattoo. <laughs> Hot women are in Brazil. We are tired of Samoan women. <laughs> but basically, this, raid. this discovery, which was published last week, could set it back by having the oldest archaeological site in all the Americas. It is where you might think it would be in Alaska, which obviously is up there by Beringia, is actually part of it. This is amazing because this site has now dated to 24,000 years ago. That's crazy. The oldest sites that we had definitively dated before that were 15. So this is amazing. It is setting it back way, way further. What's really interesting about this is it's not like an archaeologist stumbled upon this site a couple weeks ago and then published it last week. This site, the Bluefish Caves in Alaska by the border with Canada, was actually uh, dug in 1977 through 1987 field seasons. They had basically accumulated all this stuff. They had definite human occupation through the Clovis area. They knew it was at least that old. Then they found a bunch of stuff that was lower than that that appeared to be part of that cave network system. They took that back. That was sitting in a lab. What happened is a doctoral researcher started going through that collection and found evidence of human markings, human cut markings, on the bones of 24,000-year-old animals. Basically, this was a discovery that was made in a lab because these artifacts had been in that lab for decades at this point. And this is a big idea when we start talking about archaeology. This is also prevalent in paleontology. A lot of discoveries aren't going to be made by running around out in the field. As much as I hate to admit it, because that's what I like to do, a bunch of discoveries are going to be made by going through these old collections and finding things. That's how we've named two new dinosaurs in the past year. It wasn't that they discovered new bones. They just found bones in the, some old collections that turned out to be from a different species. So that species. is what archaeologists do. God damn it. God damn it. <laughs> This is amazing. This pushes back the human occupation of the Americas at least 10,000 years. This is really going to blow open a lot of stuff. Where was the site for the previous, the 15,000-year-old one? We actually have a few that are around that age. We have some coprolites, human coprolites, which is fossilized feces in the Paisley Caves in Oregon that date around 14.5. We have Tulum, Mexico, which is a child's skull. That's so around. they're already pretty much, yeah. like much further south. Well, here's the thing. The oldest site that we know for sure, 15,000, Monte Verde, Chile, southern end of Chile. So as far as way as you can get from here. So, so we so we knew it was earlier than that because exactly. it got all the way down to Chile. Exactly. So do lab archaeologists talk about field archaeologists the way Seb talks about astronomers? Like, look at him running around out in nature because oh. he couldn't hack it here in the lab. <laughs> it's trust me, it's the opposite. We look down on the lab guys. For every field archaeologist, there's three lab archaeologists looking at their stuff and wishing they were out in the field. So, yeah, well, those are the nerds of archaeology. We push them in the lab because they can't handle hiking and scorpions and shit. But they're the ones getting they're, results. They're the actual smart ones. Listen, you get one of those guys to All run. you guys do is dig. All we with, do is outrun boulders, <laughs> slide under doorways, and steal things from Native Americans. And have very questionable relationships with young Asian men. <laughs> and Nazi women. <laughs> Nothing questionable about what I did to her. <laughs> 
Uh, but this is amazing. These are actually cut marks on the jaw of an ancient horse. Some people might think, wait a second, weren't there no horses in the Americas before Europeans came and introduced them? In a way, you're right. There was a gap in time. Horses and camels both actually evolved in North America. Then they went extinct when human beings came in and out hunted them. And for 10,000 plus years, there were no horses or camels here until Europeans came back. This just proves the adage. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink no matter how many times you cut his face. <laughs> They found these cut marks. You might say, hey, how can you tell for sure this is a cut mark? How definitive is this? Is this 100%? And it is. Because this type of cut mark, one, couldn't be made later. So it could, we couldn't see this is a later group 10,000 years later finding this jaw and cutting on it just for fun or something. Like, like what is this, a penis? Like, is this <laughs> fresh bone makes different cuts than older or fossilized bone. So we know for sure this was done when it was fresh. Also, the location and type of cut is definitively a stone tool. I actually got to see some of the pictures from the publication. They are absolutely correct. There is no assumption here. We have a definitive human occupation site in Alaska at 23,000 to 24,000 years ago. There is another theory. What's that? There were animals with tools. Okay. Who then went extinct. Oh, so, hello, Jane Goodall. No, yeah, Jane. I like to weigh in here. Yeah, yeah so the, the, the Sasquatch, the Native American Sasquatch, <laughs> who resides throughout the Pacific Northwest in Alaska, is a stone tool user as well. How do you know I, that, Jane? I know that because he told me after God coitus. damn it, Jane. <laughs> They're also fantastic lovers. I, more of this research needs to be done, this type of thing of going through old collections. We have a lot of data that's sitting, rotting away in basements that is yet to be explored. The problem is it's hard to get young doctoral students excited about it. If you're trying yeah, to pitch... Because they're, they're a little bit slow in the brain. Yeah, of course. They, they want to run around and frolic yes. in, in nature instead of actually doing a real job. Yes. This, this is something I can sympathize with. I have a ton of data in my lab, at the basement in my lab, and I've tried to get young, nubile scientists <laughs> down there with me, but none of them will accept my offer. At least Sasquatch. <laughs> it's funny because as they were announcing this, I have been talking with a researcher friend of mine. A he, lab archaeologist? No, he's a field archaeologist. But he was about to start a project where he, uh, Scripps in La Jolla had mapped the coast of San Diego as it had looked back in the pleistocene Holocene boundary, back when people were kind of migrating by coastal routes and the sea levels were much lower, and they had mapped underwater caves, and he was going to go dive those caves to go look at stuff. And I told him, if you find this, if you find something at 20K out down here in San Diego, you're going to make the cover of every archaeological magazine because you're going to get that last holy grail. It turns out he just got scooped by this chick in Alaska who found this stuff that was sitting in a lab for a long time. Hopefully he still ends up doing that project because it would still be really interesting. But this was what we were all searching for. This is what every American archaeologist, especially anybody who's doing really old stuff, has been looking for. I know all these, everybody in San Diego, at least everybody who, who really is into a lot of the old stuff, because we have some of the oldest sites in North America we have in San Diego. Everybody was desperate to find that old stuff. Everybody really, really wanted to. This person has done it. Congratulations. She is going to be in history books forever, essentially. Tell your friend that if he's broken up about it, he can join me in my basement. He might find what he's looking for. If crushing pee is what he's looking it's for. It's not what he's looking for. <laughs> All right. I think you're being a little overzealous. How so? Me or Nobody's going to put an archaeologist in a history book. How do you explain Laura Croft? <laughs> All right, let's move right on to their second article. Now, this article, I got to say, Seb, Damien actually has an advantage on you. This was one of the ones we did on a prior episode that got jacked because of audio recording reasons. So Damien actually already knows a lot about this. We did this article with Dr. Ava. Unfortunately, the audience will never get to hear it because the sound quality was bad. But this is a very, very interesting article. We had to talk about it again because it will affect your daily life in the next decade. We're not talking about 50 years down the line. This is big and it's coming fast. We might have figured out how to cure cavities. We're not fucking Britain. This isn't going to be as revolutionary for us as it <laughs> really? would be. Think about what we do with teeth. If you end up getting a cavity, we just drill out that cavity, and then your tooth can't heal, and so we fill it full of some kind of material, and that's our solution. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. One, the tooth becomes weaker over time. Two, you allow for other infections to get in between that cavity material and the tooth. Three, that cavity material is not permanent. At some point, you're going to have to get it replaced. It could fall out. There's a lot of problems with that process. On Four, you've made the hole bigger. Yeah, and you know what? It's not pleasant. It's not pleasant to get that drilled out and stuff. This new discovery is really going to rock this world of dentistry because what these researchers found was that using an already FDA-approved drug, and this is really important because it means it's not 15 years down the line. It means we're not going to find out about some crazy side effects. This is already approved and being used for Alzheimer's patients. And what they found is this drug, which stimulates certain stem cell growth, if you take a biodegradable sponge matrix, soak it in this drug, shove it in that little hole, 
your fucking tooth grows back. You don't need a filling because your tooth fills itself in. It grows back like your skin would grow back if you got a cut. That's amazing. But now I can remember every toothache I've ever had. Oh, because your Alzheimer's is (laughs) here. I got it. Well, yeah, you had a a second go at this article, and that was the best joke you can come up with. Interesting. I also come from a family of grave robbers and am completely against this science. (laughs) Because that's where you get all your gold teeth, right? Yeah, exactly. I I was put through clown college. Yeah, that's right. I'm the black sheep of the family on gold fillings dug up from grapes. You're the smarter guy in your family, I think. I didn't say that. (laughs) So the drug, which is Tide Sclib, is soaked in this material and put in the tooth. Again, already FDA approved, which means theoretically if they just do a different label use, we could see this being used in regular clinical trials in in like a year. And we could see this actually being used out in the field in regular dentist office in like five years. It's really not that far off. It's cheaper than a filling, easier to do than a filling, and you have your own tooth back at the end. How crazy is that? One of the things I was just thinking in my head is, think of talking to the next generation of kids, and they go, what's with all these pictures of you guys? Why do you guys have shiny things in your mouth when you're talking? Because we just are used to the idea that people have fillings. We see them, and it becomes normal. How weird is that going to be to describe to somebody in 50 years? Oh, no, we were in such a Stone Age capability that if we got an infection in our tooth, we took a drill, like from a hardware store, drill, (laughs) drilled a fucking hole in it, and then just shoved a bunch of metal and plaster in it. Well, they used to do it with wood instead. Yeah. So and that's like us with the wooden teeth people. Yeah, and our kids are going to be like, uh, that's that's pretty crazy. And then they're like, you, you guys did that on purpose, huh? And you're like, I got one better. As a status symbol, sometimes when your teeth would rot out, you'd replace it with a precious metal like gold. But then that evolved into something where then people who had perfectly fine teeth would take gold caps and put it completely over the front to give that themselves might still a vampire. continue. Okay. Who, who doesn't like grills? I was about to say, hip-hop community is going to remember the grill. This is great because it's cheap, easy, and most importantly, permanent solution to cavities. You fix this cavity, it's gone. Maybe you'll get another cavity some other time, but you can fix that one too. Obviously, there are some things we should watch out for. Anytime you have this type of growth and stem cell stimulation, you should always worry about out-of-control growth, i.e. cancer. You should always worry about... This kind of growth stimulation could lead to out of control tumor growth. Tooth cancer. Yeah, does that that jaw can- yeah, jaw, jaw cancer does happen. But is that on your teeth? I think it's on your jaw, oh. which which it's is part of the, also, that's where yeah, you're stimulating yeah. your stem cells yeah. anyway. So it, you could you could theoretically get some jaw growth. This is something we should regulate and watch. But the fact that we're seeing its use very safely in Alzheimer's patients for over a decade means that m- this is probably something that won't have as many negative side effects as we'd expect from an untested drug. So if we've found a cure for cavities, we can go ahead and use whipped cream as toothpaste on our toothbrush. We could we could disregard. Sh- I mean, you still wouldn't want to. You would still try and keep some kind of dental hygiene as a good tactic because you'd rather not break the bone. How than- long does it take for the tooth to grow back? Now, that's going to be a question because these are still rodent studies, right? So we have to see how this translates to humans, even just for the fact that our teeth are physically so much larger Cells are only a certain size. Rat cells are the same size as human cells, so to fill that tooth is much easier for a rat. But think about it. Think how miserable it is. You got to go into the dentist. They got to figure out you got a cavity. You got to make another appointment. You got to come back in later. What if they just like, oh, here's a cavity here. I'm going to clean this up and shove the sponge in there. All right, your tooth will be back in a couple months. How amazing is that? Sugary toothpaste was really the main takeaway I got from this. (laughs) This is super exciting because this is something that is not conceptual that we're not that we're talking about. This isn't like Seb's bullshit astrophysics where we're talking about gravity or other things that are never going to bother you. This is something that you could literally see a change in your life, in your daily, everyday life in five years. Seb threw away his life. I agree. All right, guys. Super, super interesting. Let's move right on to everybody's favorite game. I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. Who is this everybody you keep referring to? Everybody loves this game, Damien. I'm going to need for you to cite your sources on everybody. Literally, I got 100% of the population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, (laughs) our ratings should be much better (laughs) than what they are. I know for a fact that you don't like this game because I got direct emails from 7,255,839 people, and there's only... 7,839,040 people total on Earth. You're literally the only person who doesn't like this game. And yet we only have 23 comments on iTunes. Even the infants said they liked it. (laughs) That's really impressive. Those are very precocious infants. Let's get started with the game where I read Forsyth News articles. My panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Article number one. 
Scientists have discovered how to make oil from the bodies of jellyfish. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. You can't find oil in jellyfish, but you can find them in peanut butter fish. What? What's a... That's a, it's an oil, it's a, is that George what, Washington yeah, Carver was discovered him. <laughs> it was a George Way Washington back. Carver discovery. You know what's bad is when the jellyfish is around the peanut butter fish and then the white bread fish comes by. <laughs> you know those guys are in danger at that point. As a fisherman, that's ideally when you want to catch them right then and there when they're all together. If you could spear them through the middle to kind of line them up. And Seb. Jellyfish are sort of gelatinous. Is that cow? I mean... Oil is made from fossils, but it's mostly plants. But ah, what the hell? Let's say it's true. All right. Article number two. The anti-malaria drug chloroquine has just been shown to help treat treatment-resistant cancer. Damien, is this science or bad science? Side note. Chloroquine is Cleon for a man who is impotent. <laughs> All right. Well, is that used to treat <laughs> treatment-resistant cancer? This is science only works on Cleon prostate cancer. That's a really specific type of cancer. Michael Dorn, sign up now. <laughs> and Seb. I have no idea. Sure, why not? All right, article number three. Scientists have finally solved the mystery of why our vision doesn't dim when we blink. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and I don't have a joke because uh, Seb said something really offensive in my ear a second ago. And then stole my answer, whatever he's about to give, if it's right. If not, <laughs> then I fuck this up. All right, Ed Seb. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you could be able to figure out just by, I don't know what the actual answer is, but I would guess it'd be something like the brain knows not to register it or and then, or then to like extrapolate but, or interpolate between the time your eyes are actually closed. Otherwise, oh. if it didn't, that person would not do very well in the world. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm looking over to your left <laughs> over there. Somebody who's not doing very well in the world. Maybe that's what's going on. Uh, he's on my right, by it's, the way. It's blinking things. Oh, no, stage left. I see what yeah. Bobby was saying. <laughs> and article number four, new research confirms the safety of using antidepressants during pregnancy. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. And this is what actually causes autism in, so in children. So therefore, it's safe? Yeah, I mean, listen. So it's confirmed to be Autistic safe children are autism. less likely to experience to engage in in risky behavior. They're less likely to contract STDs. You want a kid, safe kid? Don't bubble wrap them. Give them autism. Antidepressant the shit out of your pregnant wife. Damien really should be the next Surgeon General. It'd be oddly appropriate with this cabinet. <laughs> All it did was cause autism. It's safe. And Seb, I can't imagine that that would be a wise thing to do is take a bunch of drugs while you're pregnant. I mean, it might help the woman, but I can't imagine it's good for the development. So I'm going to say it's bad science. All right. Let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. Scientists have discovered how to make oil from the bodies of jellyfish. Damien thinks this is false. Seb thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. Seb, you were actually on the right track because it was made from pine needles. So you were right when you started talking about plants. But I was actually the one who was right. Yeah, right, but Seb made more sense. You were just... <laughs> I actually had a reason thought. Yeah. Oh, hmm. Point Damien. So... And argue with results. <laughs> so most current plastics are made from oil, which is obviously not a sustainable resource, but scientists from the Center of Sustainable Chemical Technologies at the University of Bath have developed a new renewable plastic from a chemical called pinene found in pine needles. So basically, they were able to extract this. Now, there are ways that we make non-oil plastics. Degradable polymers like PLA are made from crops like corn and sugar cane, but PLA has to be mixed with a rubber polymer called a caprolacetone to make it more flexible. Caprolacetone is made from crude oil, which basically makes even those quote-unquote non-petroleum plastics, they still have to have some oil in them. This particular pine substance actually takes the place of that particular oil product, which means that you can make these non-petroleum oil products without any petroleum whatsoever. You don't need that kind of starter base. That's fantastic because now we've completed the cycle of you can use this technology we already had to make oil from these non-oil plant things, but you don't need the oil part that we had to add before. Very, very cool stuff. Hopefully we can start doing that instead of, uh, I don't know, drilling big ass holes in the ground. <laughs> Pretty big holes. Pretty freaking sweet to drill. Article number two, the anti-malaria drug chloroquine has just been shown to help treat treatment-resistant cancer. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. 
Very cool story, one of those uplifting science stories you get to hear. After a patient's brain cancer became resistant to chemotherapy and then to targeted treatments, a 26-year-old was only given a few months to live by their doctors. This is how we see the progression of cancer. Once nothing can treat it and it's growing out of control, there's really nothing we can do. We kind of like try and live your life as best you can for the next few months. Michael Dorn's only 26? But there was a lot of idea before that you could use this already existing anti-malaria drug to try and treat these runaway cancers because essentially what it's doing is the cancer has grown immune to your therapy, whatever you're using against it, your cancer drugs, your chemo, all that stuff. The cancer has grown immune to those specific things. What we found this specific drug does is it doesn't go and fight the cancer itself. It goes and changes those cancer cells so that they once again are vulnerable to the drugs. So it's not fighting the drug. It's holding the cancer with its hands behind its head so the drug can come up like a mafia guy and just start punching it in the stomach. Cancer has malaria now. (laughs) Very, very cool stuff. Article number three. Scientists have finally solved the mystery of why our vision doesn't dim when we blink. Both of you guys thought this one was science. And this one is science and a pretty fucking cool story. So you guys might not think about this a lot, but you blink quite a few times a minute. Now, when you blink, you might think, oh, it's just my eyes closing briefly and then opening up again. Actually, it's not. When you blink, your eyes close and your eyeballs roll back into your head for a millisecond and then roll back forward. That's really interesting. But if you think about it, during that span of time that your eyes blink and roll back into your head, if during that exact same span of time, whatever you want to call it, half a second, if during that time somebody had run through the room in front of you, you would see them. You wouldn't miss that. It's not like your brain can't pick up things that happen in a half second timeline. But you don't pick up your own blinks. You don't see the back of your rear eyes rolling into the back of your head. Does a blink really take half a second? No, it can be. It can be, but it can be much shorter. But regardless of whatever that time frame is, you can register things happening in that time frame. You don't register your blinks. Well, I know why it doesn't for me is because I only blink one eye at a time. So yeah, you gotta keep on guard. (laughs) Well, you do have to blink. You have to blink because you have to lube your eyes constantly, which is why you do it and, and why your eyes roll back like that. But Seb really hit the nail on the head as to what's going on. Your brain is compensating for what's going on. It's eliminating it in the same way that every human being has a blind spot, essentially where the optic nerve comes in. On that blind spot, there is a part in everybody's vision that you can't see. It's just completely blacked out. There's nothing there. You're not getting any information in. But your mind basically erases that blind spot in your field of vision and makes you think you can see. So right now, as you are looking out, You don't see any blind spots. There is a part of your vision that you are not seeing. Your brain is tricking you into thinking you're seeing that. A similar thing is going on with this blinking. Your brain is not registering that response. Basically, once it gets the nerve response to shut your eye and roll your head back, it sends a response to the brain that eliminates what it's about to see for the next whatever it is, half a millisecond, and then it comes back. Which, what these researchers did, which was also really interesting, is they found that the eyes don't always come back to the exact same spot. So as you blink... Close your eyes, eyeballs roll back, eyelids open. At that point, your eyes aren't always reset at the exact same spot. Your brain has to actually move your eyeballs to do that, and it all does it without you noticing. What they did, which was kind of interesting, is they put these people in a dark room. They had them look at this light. They had sensors looking at them without them knowing to tell when they blinked. When they blinked, they would change the location of the light slightly in this dark room so that when they opened their eyes, their eyes would have to readjust automatically. What they found is these people could never tell that the light had changed positions because your brain automatically moves your eyes in such a way to relocate that thing you saw before you blinked so that you don't know that you've actually moved at all. And it's a weird trick. And they use this trick to essentially trick the people and be able to tell what the brain was doing. The brain was resetting those eyes and telling you this is where you were looking before. Very, very cool thing. Very cool optical illusion, very neat way to think of how your brain works and how a lot of what you see is not what you see. Whether it's your blind spot or that blinking, your brain is telling you a lot of things that aren't necessarily true, but like Seb brought up before, if you did see every blink, you would have a huge disadvantage in trying to survive. You would be constantly disoriented. You would be, your eyes would be shaking, by the way. You'd always see a shaky vision. You'd see it dim and, and get lighter and stuff. This trick your brain plays on you allows you to survive in situations where you'd otherwise die. I always think those things are neat. So the really good magicians are the magicians that time it so that their trick, so that when everybody in the audience blinks. Right, or the they get time. it right in everybody's blind Isn't spot. Isn't that the standard way? <laughs> yes, that's how David Copperfield did that Statue of Liberty thing. <laughs> All of America blinked. And lastly, article number four, new research confirms the safety of using antidepressants during pregnancy. Damien thinks this is true. Seb thinks this is false. And for the win, this one is... 
Bad science. Congratulations, Seb. Way to go. Way to just smash Damien with just another brutal, brutal beating. I don't, I don't know how brutal it was, but congratulations, Seb. You've well fought. Absolutely brutal. <laughs> it was a tie. No, 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 no. no. I know, but <laughs> the tie goes to the scientist, Damien. I've, okay, but you, about but you keep before. using a lot of words like brutal when brutal. him and I got the exact brutal same. Brutal tie. Um, brutal tie. If false, it is the opposite. Actually, we have been prescribing antidepressants to pregnant women for a long time, and what they're finding more and more now is it's causing a problem. What this most recent research shows, which is really scary. I mean, if you think about it, this is terrifying because – you only get a certain point of fetal development for the brain, the organs, and everything like that. Once you're past that point, you can't regrow them. There's nothing you can do to go back and treat that with medicine. That's either there or it's not. And what this is showing is we're seeing more birth defects with pregnant women on antidepressants than we would expect, and it's not insignificant. So babies need to be depressed early on in order That's to get right. over it. They Well, so what we're finding is that the rate of birth defects jumps up from 3 to 5% in women who don't use antidepressants to 6 to 10%. That's a doubling. What That's kind crazy. Of Good question. Quite a few, and it's depending on the specific antidepressant. So things like Paxil tend to cause heart defects in the fetus. Oh, you don't need a heart. Yeah, fuck that. Uh, other ones. You'd work on Wall Street, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> other name brand antidepressants cause lung development damage. Others, eyes, and others, face and neck issues. All of these are are crazy because that's a doubling, three to five percent to six to ten. That's literally a doubling. Think of what we're saying. We're going to double the chances of a birth defect in these these kids. That's that's an insane it's risk. It's not a kid. It's a blob of cells. No, 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 because we're talking about the risk to the kid when they're born. So, like, we're going to double the birth defects in the, in the kid that is born. Well, what drugs could the mother take to counteract this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it might – listen, we've had a – Tobacco a, is a good one. <laughs> there is an idea, which I, I, I have some uh, respect for and credence to, which is that if a, somebody is very stressed out, they're going to be a bad mom. And so sometimes it's good for them to do things that would otherwise be considered unhealthy if – it relieves stress and makes them a better person and less flipped out and stuff. That's why um, my mom drank. Yeah, of course. All the time while she was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, w with the doubling of birth defects, I think you are absolutely at a point where you say, no, this is too much. It is you too could just let them be a bit depressed for nine months. Then, yes. then they can start taking the antidepressants. Yes, but, the, there's, the but out. there's other arguments that you know, you, if you are depressed, you're not going to be getting exercise. You're not going to be doing all these other things, which also contribute to birth defects. And so there, it is a more complex issue than we're laying out. But this is a huge discovery. I mean, if you found a drug that had a 10% increase in birth defects, that would be a big discovery. We're saying a 100% increase in birth defects. That's gigantic. I look forward to a world where every mother has the wealth to pay a less fortunate woman trying to get through college to carry her baby to well, term. Well, you just said so every she... woman has the wealth, so there are no less fortunate. Yeah. So, every, so call it, every woman for college in their college years has to give birth to an older lady's child. <laughs> That makes sense, actually. You, you produce better children when you're younger, I mean, theoretically. So, or yeah. you could just get married when you're younger you and, yeah. have your, and have your kids when you're nice and fertile. But the egg would be, the egg would be unless the husband's banging the college girl on the side, the egg would be the oh, mom's. Oh, no, I thought the, the college chick was just getting pregnant and handing over the kid. <laughs> the uh, other possibility is you just, every time there's a depressed uh, pregnant woman, you tell her, why do you hate your baby? Stop hate. No, only if she's taking the drugs. Right? You're right, if she's taking the drugs, right, of right, course. Right. All right, this so is just math. I swear, I wasn't doing antidepressants. <laughs> super, super interesting. Congratulations, Seb, on just stomping on him. On Stomping him into the ground. Let's move right on to the segment that nobody likes. Damien Channel is a dead scientist. And now, Damien Channel's a dead scientist. Oh, go fuck yourself. I want to see your numbers for nobody. So zero, is it the exact opposite? Zero percent of the population? No, the except for you. Yeah, except it was like... There was like it was slightly more. So it was like what did I say? Seven billion, couple hundred million loved. I call BS. It was like seven billion, fifty million hated this and, particular. And we thing. actually talked to a real medium, and they said even the dead people hate it. Yeah, huh, that's so that's the numbers quite higher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's with nice. all the dead people. If you add those up, <laughs> Excellent. You know, again, only twenty three comments on iTunes. So I guess we just do not inspire hardcore fans. Um, all right. I would like to, before I start this bit, congratulate Seb for tying me in a very well-fought... Uh, Winning. Uh, stay in your lane, Bobby. This is, <laughs> this is Damien's segment. All right, everybody. This is Damien Channel's Dead Scientist, where I reach into the void with an ability I've always had and bring back a dead scientist to communicate and educate our audience. 
Uh, are you guys ready? Ready. You guys ready to see something spiritual? A miracle? All right. Oh, oh hello. Who has summoned Archimedes of Syracuse to the wonderful green room at the Madhouse Comedy Club? I didn't know Archimedes was a gay Jew. <laughs> I didn't. I had no idea. I'm are from... you are you the guy in uh, Independence Day? Uh, no, I, I mean my most famous role would have been working with uh, the late Robin Williams. By the way, I'm I'm I am not Harvey Firestein, who I sound like. Again, <laughs> I am Archimedes of Syracuse. Of course, just simply say that it has been said before that I sound like yes, Harvey Firestein, the actor of this. Mrs. Doubtfire and Independence Day fame. <laughs> That's how I would imagine Archimedes to sound, of course. <laughs> Most people do. So, Archimedes, why don't you tell our audience what you're famous for? Um, I was the first person to discover the area of a circle, the surface area and of a sphere, as well as the volume of a sphere. Now, these, these sound like things that a lot of people learn in basic math, but I was there was a the time this was cutting edge, and I, that's, Archimedes that's true. was that and edge. You're correct. I also had a rough but accurate approximation of pi. Was it cake? <laughs> uh, my rough approximation was pecan, and it was delicious. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm also known for uh, my streaking through the town whenever I make a discovery of Why any sort you of... Why did Yes, well, King Hiro at the time had asked me. He thought one of his smiths was Jewing him. I'm a Jew, I can say <laughs> this. On his crown, he thought he gave him pure gold and thought I would like a crown made of pure gold. But he didn't trust the blacksmith, so he asked if I could find a way if he put some silver in it. And it took me a while, but one day I was doing all of my thinking in the bathtub with lighted candles and whatnot. Then I realized how to solve this problem, and I ran out of the bathtub. That's the legend, but the real story is... So what is it you actually discovered? Because this is, by the way, your most famous discovery, so <laughs> surely you can restate it. That you can calculate the volume of an irregular object by placing it in water. Yeah, that's not. That's definitely not it. <laughs> well, no, no, no. He's right. I mean, that doesn't have to be irregular. No, but it was e you could do regular objects without that technique. He's saying you, you can do this with irregular objects you couldn't use regular geometry for. It. Thank you. It's always good to hear a true believer. Of no, I am not a believer. Come to the defense. Well, not really Archimedes' principle. Yeah, it's actually called Archimedes' principle. Yes, I, I'm not a vain man. I didn't <laughs> call it my principle. It probably was named after that posthumously. But <laughs> but the real story is that I didn't do that. I was actually I I wasn't that impressive right out of the shower. I had to think some thoughts before oh, I was going. Oh, you chubbed out before you ran out yelling Eureka. I didn't want them to think I'm Archimedes the minuscule. I want them to think I'm, it's, it's, was Archimedes part horse god or something or part centaur? <laughs> I am Sicilian though, so I'm a lying cheat. <laughs> All right, Archimedes, are you done? Uh, can we ask you our questions now? Or are you done telling everybody? You've been asking me questions this entire time. <laughs> All right, Archimedes. Uh, before Seb gets into some of the more detailed parts of your principle, I just have a question. You're also very famous for developing a simple instrument with your name in it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, the Archimedes Dilto. No, Basically, there no. wasn't a true replica of anything <laughs> I would use. Oh, the Archimedes screw? Is uh, that of what course, perhaps? yes. Could you please explain how one of those works to our audience? You would place the one end into the rectum. and one No, <laughs> it is not. <sighs> You could use it to get bilge water out of a boat. You and could how use would you do that? It's a giant screw that you just screw into the ground. It just And it constantly is rotating, tilling up soil, bringing up water, things like that. <laughs> it's actually surprisingly <laughs> close. I don't know if I'd use the term well, tilling up soil, but okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, you, I use it to till up ass. That's <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us if the, your, the story of how you died is correct? It is 100. It, it leaves out some of the finer points. Okay, I spent quite a bit of time protecting my town. The Roman soldiers, after two years, were understandably a little bit upset that some gay Jewish nerd <laughs> had bested them for so long. But I was in the middle of doing a math problem, no big whoop. And this Roman soldier wanted to interrupt me and bring me to his commander. Uh, yes, I did tell him no, but it leaves out a lot of the biting, sarcastic remarks I That's brought in. That's not what you told him, according to the Wikipedia, at least. First, I, I berated his outfit for a good ten minutes. In <laughs> sandals? Who fights in sandals? This isn't Milan on a Wait, runway. You didn't say how you died. I told the Roman soldier that I wouldn't come with him, and he struck me, and I died from the blow. That's unfortunate. So, so, I was so, Glastra Archimedes. Are, so are you just saying Wikipedia is incorrect? I mean, that is possible. 
Oh, did he stab me? What, the Wikipedia? The Wikipedia that I reviewed before I came here as well as a couple videos about my life on YouTube. Because I like to fact check YouTube said that I was struck by a Roman soldier for refusing yeah, to go. Yeah, but apparently what you told them was don't don't touch my circles. That that was the last thing I said before I died. I wasn't addressing the Roman soldiers. <laughs> and by the way, the circles wasn't even about that. I was see, my brother is, was needed to be a British au pair to get custody of his children. And the circles were the bosoms that I was crafting for him to make his ruse all the more complete. That is completely untrue. Few people know that uh, in ancient Greek, circles and sphincters were the same word. So there you go. <laughs> oh, I didn't want to hide the fact that I had a second sphincter. That was uh, the, yeah, everybody has multiple sphincters. It was the secret to my genius. No, you know the sphincter I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, well, I'm not going to sit here and talk to two sphinctery and intolerant individuals as you two. All right, I'm going back up to heaven. Goodbye, everybody. Tell the owner of that penis. Nice penis. Stop saying that. <laughs> it's weird. <sighs> what's weird? What's, what's weird? I just, I, who, who is it this time? Uh, and are you convinced? It, no. I, yeah. <laughs> Sam, Sam, you don't even believe in the EM drive, so I, I'm... <laughs> I just feel like uh, the portrayal of that particular scientist made him seem like he had too much of a smoker's cough. <laughs> I don't feel like there was a lot of tobacco being smoked in ancient Greece. So Maybe it wasn't tobacco he was smoking. I don't know what else they were smoking in ancient Greece. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much. This has been Jamie and Channels, the Dead Scientist. Uh, thank you, Seb, for helping us record this particular episode part of it in duplicate thank you audience for coming back where you learned about denying the correlative fallacy how the last holy grail of archaeology was just discovered last week how soon we'll be growing back teeth instead of filling cavities how we can make oil out of pine needles how an anti-malaria drug might help you beat cancer why our vision doesn't dim when we blink and why you probably shouldn't take antidepressants if you're pregnant Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we hope to see you back next week for Science Faction 159. Brother, you came to me, Archimedes. I'm the best with hair and makeup. Let me finish this. Now put the wig on. There you go. You're Jane Goodall. Oh, hello! You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>